Thanks for your kind words, Dr. Anarumo. And thank you also to Dr. Afanito and the Board of Trustees for all you do. Know which evokes not just excellence in academics, but a spirit of selfless service, of community, of integrity. It is incredibly humbling to be recognized with an honorary degree, along with four others by the Norwich community. Thank you. Thank you for that recognition. And today is a very exciting day, not only for the students about to graduate, but for the friends and faculty who have supported them to reach this milestone. And most of all, for their families who sacrifice to get them to this special day. Today is just a beginning, the beginning of your journeys into the professional fields that you will join, that you will shape, that you will one day lead. Very soon, many of you will cross a threshold into commissioned service in the United States military. So regardless of the branch you will enter, all of you have chosen to undertake the work that is fundamental to our nation's security, to prepare for war, and if necessary, to fight a war. And for those of you who will enter other professions, healthcare, environmental science, cybersecurity, criminal justice, and many others, your work will not only shape society, but it will influence the strategic environment of our nation and that that our military must navigate into the future. No matter how high the mountain or how wide the valley, the American people have relied on Norwich grads for leadership for years and years, and we will continue to do so with the class of 2021. While in your senior year at Norwich, our country has witnessed turbulent times, which have been intensified by a formidable fight against a global pandemic. Despite the challenges the pandemic placed before your path, you persevered together to reach your shared goals, to complete your academic studies, to take care of one another, and to selflessly serve our nation in or out of uniform. Together, you represent the quality that gives America its unique strength, what makes us undaunted by the difficult and motivated by the so-called impossible. The strength of our nation, this experiment in liberty, is codified in the simple Latin phrase, e pluribus unum, out of the many come one. Represented in this graduating class are students from 40 states, from California to the New York Islands, from all walks of life, from the country to the city, both male and female, Catholic and Protestant, Jewish and Muslim, Asian and Indian, black and white. This class also includes students from 11 countries and five continents. You bring varied cultures, perspectives, and ideas from every corner of our country and from all over the globe. But what unites you, bonds you in thought and action, is your shared desire to make your communities, from the local to the global, safer and better places. Your commitment to serve a career greater than yourself. And when we talk about service, Norwich is a very special place with a storied past. It has roots that dive deep into American history and graduates who defined the very essence of the American spirit. Think back to the founding days of Norwich in 1819, when Alden Partridge brought a vision for training citizen soldiers to life in the pastures of Vermont. At that time, we had earned our liberty as a nation in the American Revolution and recently emerged from the War of 1812 against Britain. That world, when Norwich came into being, was a world of instability, a world of uncertainty. It was a world in which radical and significant political, economic, and geostrategic change was underway. In an effort to control the chaos and violence that had ripped through five continents, the great powers of the time came together, and they formed the Concert of Europe in 1815 at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, and ushered in a period of relative peace and prosperity that lasted roughly a century. There was still war, but it was limited and regional. The Crimean War, America's Civil War, the First and Second Boer Wars, and the Russia-Japanese War, and several others, all significant, but not great power wars. Then, 
With a shot of a pistol in the summer of 1914 in Sarajevo, the world was yet again cast in a cataclysm of deadly global conflict that unveiled the destruction on a human scale not yet unseen by humanity. Between 1914 and 1945, the First and Second World Wars laid waste to countries everywhere. 150 million people killed in the most violent three decades of human history. At the end of World War II, the leaders of 1945 designed our current rules-based international world order. There have been a lot of wars since 1945, each with a significant loss of life, but there has not been a great power war. We are now in our 76th year of the great power peace following World War II, and it's under stress. We can see it fraying, and with the history as our guide, we would be wise to lift our gaze from the never-ending urgency of the present to set the conditions for a future that prevents great power war. Both my mother and father fought in World War II. My mother took care of the wounded coming back from the Pacific in Seattle at a hospital with the Navy. And my father was a Navy corpsman with the 4th Marine Division making the assault landings at Kwajalein and Saipan, Tinian, and Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima saw almost 7,000 Marines killed and 34,000 wounded in less than a month. The toll of war, any war, is terrible, but the toll of great power war is unbelievable. From September to November of 1918, in the Meuse Argonne campaign of World War I, over 26,000 American soldiers and Marines gave their lives in only six weeks. From June to August of 1944, between the invasion of Normandy to the liberation of Paris, over 34,000, 34,000 American troops were killed in just eight weeks. We must preserve great power peace, but the consequences of not doing so are catastrophic. Right now, we are in a great power competition with China and Russia, and we need to keep it at competition and avoid great power conflict. Each of you will play an important role in keeping the peace. You can expect to be at the edge many times to make hard choices with imperfect information. You will have to keep guard up against the enduring nature of evolving security challenges. Each and every one of you are going to be fundamental to our nation's defense in the years to come. And you are well equipped to meet these challenges. You're about to graduate from an institution that has taught strength of character and leadership and perseverance in each and every one of you. Many Norwich alumni have distinguished themselves through extraordinary contributions to our country, and you are bound to them by your unique Norwich experience, the sacrifices you have chosen to make, and a legacy of selfless service. All of you know what it means to say, I will try. When America has faced dark days and challenging times, Norwich cadets and graduates have always stood ready to answer the call. The entire class of 1862 enlisted in the Union Army as soon as they graduated. They commanded divisions, brigades, and regiments, and served in over 130 significant battles and organizations throughout the war. On the eve of the U.S. entry into World War I, a young man named Ted Brooks graduated from Norwich in 1916. During the Meuse-Argonne campaign, then Lieutenant Brooks earned a Distinguished Service Cross. Later, in World War II, then Lieutenant Colonel Brooks joined a new armored force at Fort Knox, only one year later, in 1942, Brooks was promoted to Major General. Why so fast? Obviously, the demands of the war, but equally important and perhaps more important, was his competence and his character. Ted Brooks was extremely competent. He was innovative. He was adaptive. Brooks had developed the M7 self-propelled artillery as well as the M8 assault gun. He not only developed the weapons, but the doctrine to accompany them. He trained soldiers at the small unit level to instill new armored tactics. And Brooks eventually commanded the 11th Armored Division 
the Second Armored Division, and the Sixth Corps. All were instrumental in the defeat of the Nazis. He also had a spine of steel, an immense moral and physical courage under the intense life or death pressure of mortal combat. It is said that his men loved him, so we know he also had compassion, a key ingredient for a great leader. You two, every one of you, are going to have to think and act and be innovative like your predecessors, like General Brooks. These qualities and how you bring them to the joint force will be invaluable. As a nation, we have often found ourselves unprepared for the opening shots of war. When American troops engaged the Nazis and Japanese in 1942, we were not ready to fight and certainly not ready to win. Nowhere was this more evident than at the Kasserine Pass, where we suffered a horrible defeat against the battle-hardened German Africa Corps. A lot of young men gave their lives in that battle because we were not competent, we were poorly led, and we weren't well trained. Now is the time to break that national pattern of ours, and we must always be prepared. Because right now we are in the midst of a fundamental change in the character of war. Remember another great leader from Norwich, General Ernest Harmon. He commanded the 1st Armored Division in North Africa and Italy in the first half of World War II. But it was the adversity of Kasserine Pass that revealed Harmon's rare blend of competence and character. He stood out and stepped up as the deputy commanding general, replacing a relieved general officer. He reorganized two corps and adjusted tactics in a very rapid manner and instituted a training program that brought the beleaguered corps back to life after the painful lessons of Kasserine. He then transferred responsibility of two corps to his newly arriving commanding general, George Patton. By 1943, we had started to bounce back. And by 44, we hit our stride in nine theaters of global war, from Europe to the Middle East to Asia. And the result was unconditional victory in 1945. Harmon was a hero, no doubt. But he had one thing that you will not have, and that is time. You will not have months or years to correct mistakes, evolve, and adapt to defeat our enemies. We live in an age of artificial intelligence, of robotics, hypersonics, long-range precision munitions, and we can see and strike targets at ranges that have never existed before in human history. We are defining what overmatch capability will look like in our most expansive domain, space, and cyber. The country that masters new technologies, combines them with the doctrine and develops leadership to take advantage of them, the side that does that best will have a decisive advantage at the start of the next war. Look back in the history of this school and the heroes that have gone before you and study them because no less is going to be asked of you. 20 years from now, in 2041, many of you will be at the helm of the joint force. Be bold. Innovate. Challenge yourselves to meet the threats that loom on a faraway horizon. And remain vigilant, because your time to respond may, in fact, be very, very short. We must always stand ready. Stand ready to deter a great power war, for the cost is just too high not to get it right. And you do that by being prepared to win if war breaks out. To quote our founding father, George Washington, to be prepared for war is one of the most effectual means of preserving peace. But there's something more important than innovation and readiness. It has to do with the oath that some of you are going to take as soon as you're commissioned here very shortly. All of us in uniform, enlisted and officer alike, take an oath of allegiance. And that oath is a symbol, a sacred symbol. And it says simply that I solemnly swear to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. You know, there's over 190 countries in the world that are in the United Nations. But we, the United States of America, we're the only one to have a military that swears an oath to a document, not to a person, a tribe, a religion, but to an idea. And there's th one message for you to remember today, it is the message of your oath. What we stand for as Americans, 
and why we fight. Embedded within that document is the idea, the idea that that is America, that came into being over 240 years ago. You're going to swear an oath that you are willing to die to protect that idea. And you're going to be willing to give your life, your precious arm, your eyesight, without any purpose of invasion or grievous wounds, to lose your arm or leg, to separate from your family, or to die in the defense of that idea. In this idea, in our Constitution, in our Declaration of Independence, it's so powerful that the Nazis were deathly afraid of it. The Communists feared it. The Soviet Union collapsed because of it. We defeated Imperial Japan because of it. The fascists in Italy and the terrorists of Al-Qaeda and ISIS, they hate it. They hate this idea. And what is the essence of this idea? Look around you right now, and you can see the idea. Wherever you are at home, at Norwich, no matter where you are, just look to your left and look to your right, and you'll see the idea. And the idea says that every single one of you, it doesn't matter if you're a male or a female, if you're gay, straight, transgender, it doesn't matter what you are. It doesn't matter if you're white or black, Asian or Indian, or any other ethnic group. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter if you're Catholic or Protestant, Muslim, Jew, or choose not to believe at all. It doesn't matter what the country of origin is or the spelling of your last name. None of that matters. It doesn't matter if you're tall or short, rich or poor, famous or common. The idea that's in that Constitution, the idea that my parents fought for in World War II, the idea that has propelled us through our darkest days as a nation, affirms that every single one of us is created equal in the eyes of the law. It says that in this country, in these United States, no matter who you are, Every single one of us is equal. In America, you will rise or fall based on your knowledge, your skills, and your attributes. And you're going to be judged by the content of your character. Nothing else matters. And we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and all women are created equal. We operationalized that idea in an imperfect way. But we took that idea, and every single day, as it says in the Constitution, we strive to make a more perfect union. We are not a perfect union, and we have 27 amendments to show for it. But to show our tireless pursuit of progress in order to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. And that's the why. That is why this country exists. And that is who we are as a people. That is why I wear this uniform. That is why my dad landed at Iwo Jima. That is why those men died and the Muse are gone. This is what you are committed to defend. And this is why we fight. Graduates, we are proud of you. You have difficult tasks and heavy work ahead of you, but your futures gleam with boundless potential. Thank you for your dedication and service to our great nation. May God bless all of you and the United States of America.